So, Matthew 18. This is our fourth installment. This is an incredible chapter. But just previous, last week, we looked at what is sometimes called the church discipline passage. And it's like, oh yeah, know that passage. Got to discipline those people. But as we looked through it, we, we looked in depth at the passage and we discovered taking this passage with the systematic of the whole of the Bible and God's heart towards people, that it truly should be called the relationship restoration passage as opposed to the church discipline passage. Because the goal was about restoration, not retribution or not retaliation, which is often the way we take it. And we feel like the word of God might give us license to go after people, and that's not it at all. The, the, the Bible gives us a, a command to go after people in love for the idea of rest, restoring relationship. And so as this passage develops, we see at first he's talking about the lost sheep, that the, the shepherd would go after the the one and leave the 99 behind. Why? To, to bring that sheep back into fellowship. And then again last week we talked about the lost relationship through sinful offense. But today we're going to be looking at forgiveness as necessary and essential. And that it is a command. And so obviously if there's an offense and things going on, you need to forgive. And understand this, if unforgiveness, if you're holding on to it, it will affect every part of your life. And it said it, it, it's like an unseen disease. Before they discovered uh, the, the microscopes and before they discovered that germs were a cause of so many infections, very often doctors were infecting patients without knowing. And all of a sudden something's happening and someone's dying or something's happening to their body and they don't know what happened. And it's unseen because we can't see germs with the naked eye. We just see re uh, results of them. And sometimes in our own life or sometimes in someone else's life around us, something is happening, bubbling up. Something is sick, a sore. There's pus spiritually in their life. Sorry to gross you out. But, but it, it's not good. And many times it goes back to the problem of unforgiveness. And the Lord is very serious about our ability and the, His command to make us forgivers of one another. And so Matthew 18, 21 is where we're starting. And it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, that's a logical question, right? Because they were talking about the offensive brother, the one that was sinning against a brother, and he, he's supposed to, you know, uh, restore this person. And you can imagine Peter and all his young man pride expecting a positive response from Jesus and then turning around to the other guys and going, yeah, did it again. I'm Peter. Now, some background on this idea of forgiving people. Remember, they were in a legalistic culture where it wasn't really about the relationship with God. It was more about the religion and following rules. It's called legalism. And in that day, the rabbis had actually come up with a number of offenses that you were under the law of God supposed to forgive someone over. You were allowed three times, and then after that, you could just write them off. It was three times in the rabbinical tradition of the day. And they would argue whether it should be two or four, but they never went up to seven. So Peter comes up with this, this idea, Jesus is about grace. I'll get him. And the number seven is, is a number of completion. Right? Six days he created the world, and the seventh day he rested, and he throws this out to Jesus. But seven times, if someone offends you seven times, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's a pretty high standard. I, uh, Peter's not doing too bad here. Now, I'm going to take a little side here, because people get mixed up with forgiveness, and they don't really understand the wholeness of forgiveness, because forgiveness can be manipulated as well. But there's a, a verse in Matthew chapter 10... He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So, here's the idea. I don't want to put myself in a place to be offended by a brother so often that it ruins our relationship either. That's where the, the wisdom comes in. And, and the harmless means I'm willing to forgive. So, so understand, I, I, I need to, to mention that because there can be people that you're supposed to forgive me every time. 
And the fact of the matter is, yeah, they are supposed to forgive you, but they're also not supposed to be stupid towards you either. (laughs) And so understand this. I value my relationships with people, so I'm very careful about my own heart towards that person. So let's just say someone borrows some money from me, and they just forget to pay it back. Well, they do it once. It's like, eh, they forgot. I forgot. I didn't want to bring it up. It's not worth it. The relationship is worth more than the money in that case. But what if they do it every week? Am I supposed to forgive them and then loan them the money again the next week if it's happening 10, 15, 20 times? So you see how this could be abused. Oh, you're supposed to, I thought you forgave me for that. Loan me 20 bucks, whatever. But the thing is, I want to be wise. I don't want to be angry with the person. I want to be wise and understand where my heart is as well. I want to keep the relationship good. So I will tell that person, yes, I have forgiven you, but I'm not going to loan you any money because it's starting to frustrate me and it's getting in between our relationship. So I'm not going to loan you the money in order for the relationship to be good. So I forgave you, but I'm also not going to be stupid. See how that works? Because you value the relationship. And sometimes that happens. And what happens? We're just shoving down all this bitterness and the relationship is broken because we just can't be around that person because they annoy us. And we never talk about it. And we never do the wise thing, okay? Now, um, so the idea is I'm not obligated to allow someone's sinful behavior to destroy our relationship, so I need to be wise. I know my heart, and I value relationships. Therefore, I need to be wise about that relationship. So that's just money. But we can probably relate to that, right? Right? But let's go a little deeper. Let's just say a woman is being abused by her husband, whether it be physical, emotional, or spiritual abuse. But let's just say it's physical abuse. She's supposed to forgive, isn't she? So she forgives, and then the husband comes back the next time and beats her. And then she forgives again. And then he beats her again. And then she forgives again. She's trying to do what the Bible says, but she's not doing it in a wise way either. So she should forgive. But the problem is, she's not obligated to allow her husband's sin to continue. In fact, it's more loving to do something to stop that sin. So you're supposed to be wise and innocent at the same time. That's how it works. And so understand, you're not obligated, and it's better for that spouse or that husband in this particular story to either be arrested and wake up and get some counseling and get fixed so he can have an actual good relationship with his wife without destroying it ultimately and not heaping up judgment into his life by continuing to sin. See how that works? And so a woman isn't obligated to be the the object of a husband's sin continually in a harmful manner because you need to be able to forgive and also be wise at the same time. You guys understand? So here, here's a simple principle. Back to the money. We'll get off that heavy note, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, back to... Uh, I won't lend a friend more money than I'm, than I'm willing to lose in order to keep the friendship. See how that works? I'm not going to loan you, because if you default or something happens, I don't want to say, I hate you now, and break the relationship. So that's the wisdom side of it. You see how that works? And now you may be a very generous person, go, eh, yeah, whatever. I love you. And so that's how that works. Because the problem is, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. You guys ever feel that way? And that person you just trusted again and again, you're trying to do a Christian thing, and I'm like, ah! It's just very frustrating. And so I think it says it in a good way. I've broken my feet and I've chipped all my teeth. (laughs) So I understand what that's about. So anyways, Peter comes up with this number. It's a good number. Seven. Number of completeness. That's more than most of us in our natural self without the Holy Spirit would be willing to forgive. And what does Jesus say? Oh, poor Peter. He just thinks he's so smart. The Lord returns and he says to him, verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Seven's the number of completeness in the Bible. Seventy's the number of completeness in the Bible. You got 70 times seven. What's the Lord trying to say? Absolute, complete forgiveness, right? That's what he is trying to say. And so forgiveness is a big deal to Jesus. 
Remember back at the start of his ministry, he gave a discourse, he gave a speech, which became known as a Sermon on the Mount. And during this sermon, Jesus gave us the structure that we should follow in prayer, or basic structure of prayer. And included in this prayer was forgiveness. And so in Matthew chapter 6, it says, and forgive us our debts, this is part of the prayer, not the whole one, but forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so it's not saying, you know, deliver us from demon possession. He's, he's saying, as a believer, I don't think you could be demon possessed, but he's saying the influence of Satan in your life. Remember, Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter didn't become Satan. He was being influenced by Satan. And all of us can be, and we need to have the Lord protect us. So that's a good prayer. But I want you to note the flow and the context. Because he says amen, and then what does he do? He says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I tell you what, a big part of Satan's tool in your life as a Christian to hinder you and to disrupt you and to make you useless for the kingdom. I'm not saying not be saved, but I'm just saying less useful is unforgiveness because you have forgiveness, Satan, and he, then he gives a warning on forgiveness, right? And so we're forgiven vertically, therefore we can forgive horizontally. We're loved vertically, therefore we can love horizontally. Is it hard to love others? Seek the Lord more, and you'll be able to love others more. That's how it works. He is a source of these incredible virtues that many times we don't have any of in our flesh. And so our relationships with God, relationship with God gets better through Jesus Christ. Therefore, our relationships horizontally can get better. And one thing that is in the way of those relationships, remember this whole passage, restoration of relationship, is the ability to forgive. And unforgiveness hinders you. But if you've received forgiveness from heaven, you also need to be willing to forgive others. And so deliverance from the evil one sounds like the temptation of the evil one is directly couched with unforgiveness. That's the context, right? We're looking at it. It's the Bible. I'm not, I didn't manipulate it here. That's what it says, at least in the English translation. But you could literally pray and in many ways, deliver me from unforgiveness here. And a bunch of other things, obviously, but... Our topic today is unforgiveness. Deliver me, Lord, from, from Satan's call to, to give me a grudge and a root of bitterness in my life and to hold on to what I think is power, which is actually a cancer in your life as Christians. So he makes this warning again in this passage. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Now, it's kind of a weird verse, but when you take the Bible as a whole, you understand the Lord forgives you, and then you forgive others, right? That's the order. But I think this is an identifier. Why? He says, if you're able to forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father is able to forgive you. It really identifies the believer, because here's the thing. When people say, I will not forgive... Or I, I have no plans to attempt to forgive. I refuse to go down the road of even learning how to forgive. At that point, you need to, you, you, the question is, are you really a Christian? Right? Because if you're absolutely unwilling to do what the Lord commands, or even try or start down that road, are you even saved? Have you experienced God's radical forgiveness in your own life? So even here I see it as an identifier of who truly is a believer. Because if you've been forgiven, you can, as we will see today, as we look at this, you can for forgive. And these are Jesus' words. Some of you right now might be mad at me. I didn't say it. These are red letter edition, you know. It's, it's his words. I don't know how he spoke in red letters, but it, it worked that way. It, it's how it happened. Some people say, do you really expect me to forgive that pastor? And I might say, it doesn't really matter what I think. The Lord expects you to forgive. Because those are his, his words. Verse 23, Jesus goes on. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So this is Matthew 18, 23. So he starts this parable. And again, the parable is about restoration. 
So that is the context. So to understand a parable, a parable is a story, a come alongside help. It helps you understand things. And so this good king wanted to get the burden of debt out of the way with his servants. Why would he forgive them their debts? He wanted that thing that was blocking their relationship out of the way. It's always, you come to work, you're thinking about it. I try to talk to you about an issue, you think about it. Let's get this out of the way. Let, let, let's come to a solution. And that's what the Lord desired to do with us. Why? Because sin separates us from God. And he deals with sin so that he can have a better relationship with us, right? That's what he did. I love Isaiah chapter 59. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's not God's fault that you don't have a relationship with him. His, his arm is big enough to save you. His ear is big enough to hear you. But sin is in the way. And it's, your, and, it, and it's our fault, right? Because God is sinless. And so it's in the way. And then it goes on for quite a few verses and talks about Israel's sins. But then it gets down to verse 16 in Isaiah chapter 59. And it says, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. My people are a mess. Human, human beings are a mess. Sin is separated. I, 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 I can't have a deep, close relationship with them. There's no man that can save them. He looks around. There's no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor, no one to stand in the way to help these people. And then what does the Lord say through Isaiah? Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. And his own righteousness, it sustained him. What did the Lord send? His own arm, his right arm, his right hand, Jesus Christ, to come and save. Therefore, since we couldn't do it, he did it. And so he paid that debt that kept us out of relationship, just like in the story. So theologically, it, it, it flows with the whole of the Bible here. And so the basic content of the passage, or context of the passage, lines up here. We are to resolve the debt. We, we need to come to a reasonable understanding and solution as to restore the relationship. But there came a man before him who could not pay his debt. Now, some of the experts that look at this passage, you know, it, it's, it's a huge debt. It's not a little debt. It's millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth in our dollars today of a debt. So it's, it's, it's almost, it's just this ridiculous amount to, to get his point across. Okay? So he comes to him. In verse 25 it says, But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant, listen, he knew he couldn't pay. So what did he have to do? He was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave all the debt. All of it. So the solution without forgiveness is the law. He was in trouble. The solution to the law is grace and mercy. And that's what he showed. Now, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're under the law. You got to pay. And there's a debt, and it's hundreds of millions of dollars, and you can't pay it. It had to be someone else. So the master and the king in this story has the ability to forgive, and that's precisely what he did. Verse 28, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and he threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So the man who was forgiven millions would not forgive thousands. That's a problem. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. So these fellow servants, these fellow citizens, these peers were grieved because of the public offense. They were very grieved. They weren't mad. And grief is related to anger, but they were more sad 
both for the unforgiving servant and for the unforgiven servant. No one wins when there's not forgiveness. The Lord does not delight in the death of the wicked. In the death of the wicked, that's sad. It's not a good thing. He desires that none should perish. And and he paved a way that they wouldn't have to. And so these peers are broken. And understand, in the church, so often, when, when, when someone messes up, we get angry with them instead of broken for them. And, and, and it's so much better to have a heart for that person, even though they may have pushed a button. So what do you got to do? You got to check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? You got to back up and go, okay, Lord, help me have your attitude towards this person and your love towards this person. And remember, it's all about restoration and not retribution. So in the church, there should be a brokenness over unholiness in its midst. The church, I don't know, I don't know if the church really talks about holiness too much anymore. Because it's now about being cool and accepted by the culture, which is perishing. In a million years, it will not matter that you had someone picketing outside of your church because you didn't agree with their particular sin that they want you to agree with. So what? We please God and we got we're in God's hands. So it's dangerous to let behavior, sinful behavior, become the norm. But unfortunately, I think, you know, the the, the church in America can grow really large because it's a great place to be and we're really good at entertaining people and the chairs are comfortable and the AC's on and the band's rocking and the laser light show is happening that we forget to talk about the thing that really hinders the depth of the church, these core values. And one of them is forgiveness. And we need to deal with it. And if you have a bunch of bitter people, you know what they do? They make other people bitter. The hardest church to ever pastor is a church that has gone through a church split. Because you have a bunch of bitter people, and and, and it leavens a whole lump. Like it says, Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why? A little bit will spread and it will grow. It will corrupt the whole batch. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, it says, your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? And, and that particular one was, was uh, not the, the legalism of the Pharisee and the Sadducees, but it was, a, it was a, a sexual sin. And the whole church can be affected by this. It needs to be dealt with, holiness. But I tell you what, unforgiveness and bitterness can flow through a congregation, and it can just become known for that. But here's the thing, we're also called to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, and a church is loving. Sometimes that's catching. It's a little harder to catch love because you need some supernatural encouragement to do so. But let that be what spreads through the church, not some other sin. And so they see this and they're grieved, and they let the king, the master, know what had happened. Verse 32, then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? So understand, the king obviously understood his role of a model of what is right, and that's exactly what Jesus did. And so our attitude should be this way. I'm going to show you so much blank that you will obviously show it to others. Let that be you in the church. I'm going to show love so it spreads. And you can show it to others. I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to show you forgiveness. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to pray for you that you pray for others. Whatever it may be, whatever virtue the Lord has for us, we have the opportunity to do it. He has enabled us to do so. He's given us the power to do so. Remember back in Matthew 6, the disciple was to forgive, and it was an identifier on whether he really was a disciple or not. If you're able to forgive, you've received forgiveness. You you recognize it. And that's a kingdom parable. This is a kingdom parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the presence of God in us is the kingdom of heaven. Wherever God is, the presence of God is, that's the kingdom of heaven. Eventually, it's going to move into the millennium, and eventually after that, it'll move into its eternal state, the new Jerusalem. But that's the presence of God. So the kingdom of heaven is like, this is what we're looking at. So verse 34 goes on, it says, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So he was angry. That word angry is also provoked. He was exasperated. But it's in the passive tense. It happened to him as opposed to him working up a hatred for the guy. He's broken. You didn't get it. 
and you're, you need to be punished because you're not, you didn't get it. The sin of unforgiveness offended the king. It had been accepted, seemingly, but not passed on. Jesus uses a prostitute as an example. He says this. He says, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. The other, 50. So you got 500 days wage over 50 days wage. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one he forgave more. And he said to him, you have right, rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I, the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But who, to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, here, here's the thing. I was, I was raised a good little Baptist boy, and I don't have a really good testimony. But here's what happens. God doesn't have to, like, I don't have to have a really bad testimony for me to love God. What I have to do is learn to know who God is more and learn his otherness and his holiness and that he actually loves me and cares for me. And when I do that, I realize who I really am. And so Christian maturity is really realizing who you are and realizing who God is. And that gap becomes larger as you truly mature in the Lord. You, you lose that pride in the reality of who you are. It, it sets in in the reality of who God is just starts to blow your mind and the gap between is the love of God towards you so God loves me so much but my understanding of God's love grows as I study him and I realize who I am and that's called Christian maturity just an awe of the love of God for you Christian maturity isn't having more rules being able to look down on people for their behavior you know uh, Christian maturity is just realizing the love that God has for you and living in that way and so I've been forgiven much, and I'm learning more all the time, and I'm learning more about God's love all the time, right? And, and so we, we can all be there, but these, these Pharisees didn't think that they had much to be forgiven, so they loved little, and that's heavy. Do you have a high estimation of yourself, a low estimation of your sin, a low estimation of God's holiness? Then, yeah, you're good, whatever. You can figure it out. But if you live within reality, guys... You, you're just embracing the Lord all the more. Even as you get older, even as you seem to sin less, you still need him all the more. And it's a beautiful thing to realize that. And that's the point of that story, and it's a beautiful story. So understand that seeking forgiveness is one thing. Got to get out of trouble. I'm going to seek it from the Lord. But the Lord expects us to give it, and that's another thing. Isn't that hard sometimes? Right? But you've got to forgive the one who has sinned or offended you. So the king represents God the Father in the story. And this man was tortured or tormented, and it was this man's fault. He was forgiven vertically by the king, but refused to forgive horizontally, so he truly wasn't a receptor of forgiveness. Now understand this. How would this man in this story repay this unpayable debt if he's in debtor's prison? He's in an impossible situation. So what is the king waiting for? The king is waiting for this man to truly receive forgiveness and to forgive his debtors himself. That's the way out. You can't work your way out or pay God off. It's an unpayable, it's an unpayable debt. And Jesus is the only one that can pay your debt. And you're thinking, oh, I'll be good from here on out. Listen, you've already sinned. Being good is what you were designed to do. You can't earn anything by doing what you're supposed to do. You're just, you're just treading water. But you've already sinned. You're already below the threshold of getting into heaven on your own. But let's, let's talk about forgiveness as a gift from God. Because now I've, I've laid this heavy stuff on you. Like, oh, I'm an unforgiver. I'm condemned. You know, whatever. Listen. God wants to see your effort. 
Now, we say that live fish swim upstream. Are they always making progress? I've watched those nature channels, you know, those salmon. <laughs> they're going, <laughs> they're trying to go up the waterfall. They're not getting anywhere. But they're swimming, aren't they? So they're still alive. Dead fish float downstream. But sometimes as you're swimming upside, upstream, the current gets so bad that you're actually going backwards as you're still swimming. That's what the Lord's looking for in you. The Dory theology. Just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. <laughs> right? It works. And the Lord embraces your effort. And, and you may have years of bitterness, and you wake up today and you think, God, I, I've got to do this. And the Lord's rejoicing that you're turning that corner. He wants you to keep swimming towards forgiveness. So here's the thing, though. Being able to forgive brings freedom. It brings absolute freedom. Who suffers most when there's unforgiveness? The one not forgiving, right? Listen, as a pastor, you know, and I don't try to hurt people's feelings, but I, I can. And I've had people leave the church and four years later come back to the church and tell me, I've been holding a grudge against you for four years and I realize it's wrong. I'm sorry. And they'll describe the situation. I'll look and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why you left. <laughs> you know, it's like, who was suffering? Not me. They were tormented because of unforgiveness. It, it does that, doesn't it? That, that, that prison description being tormented and tortured, you do it to yourself if you refuse to forgive. And you think it's power and you think, oh, I'm getting at them. No, many times they forgot about you. Unforgiveness is a prison of your own making. But forgiveness gives God the opportunity to give you joy. Whereas unforgiveness shackles you to the one who hurts you. Do you who do you want to have control? Do you, do you want to be chained to the actions of a sinner? They may even be dead. You know, I talk to people, I counsel people a lot. It's like, oh, I'm so angry at my parents and I just can't get over it. I go, well, why don't you call them up and, and forgive them? Oh, they've been dead for 20 years. Cut the chain. Because you're holding this unforgiveness and it is hindering you moving forward. And Jesus is serious about forgiveness, as we know. When you're full of unforgiveness, it's like walking around with rotting animal carcasses chained to you. You're hindered and you stink. And sometimes you're just looking at the person like, what is up? But they're just carrying unforgiveness. Or you're asking, what's up with me? And you realize you've just been dwelling in bitterness in your head. And treating people lousy because you, you're, you're holding on to unforgiveness. And also theologically, listen, this goes for the church. Most of us in here are saved and we receive forgiveness from God and we're trying to show forgiveness to one another. But sometimes you can hold a grudge against someone who God has forgiven. Who in the world has given you the right to not forgive someone that God himself has forgiven? You don't have that theological right, do you? Now, many people say, well, forgive and forget. You know, if you tell me to, to, to don't think about chocolate ice cream, no, don't think about it, what am I going to do? Think about chocolate ice cream. God has the ability to cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know fully what that means theologically, but I, I know I, I, many times when someone sins, I, I try to forget like I'm sinning because I haven't forget. No, he says, forgive. Forgive is a willful choice. It is a choice of the will to forgive. And you do that, and eventually the feelings come. Why? Because a thousand times you picked it back up, and it's like, oh God, I gotta forgive this. You get so tired that you let it go. Again, Disney theology. Let it go. <laughs> but let it go. And you get tired of picking up. The Lord knows my heart. That's why he said 70 times, seven times. Because man, it runs around in my head. And I tell you, the, Getting older is hard, but one of the greatest blessings of getting older is you can forgive and forget a lot more, right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Do I hear an amen? You know, it's like, yeah, it's good stuff. <coughs> Some people say, oh, pastor, I can't forgive. And really the question needs to be, are you saved? And then that's a challenge because you, you need to dig deep into God and realize how much he loves you. And you need to grow deeper in your theology, and you can't have a Sunday, you know, K-love walk with God. You need to have an everyday walk with God, because it's serious stuff, isn't it? 
But if you answer, I'll try, I'm going to do it. And I realize today I'm full of bitterness. The Lord is, <laughs> angels are rejoicing that you're, you're, you're turning around and you're making that step towards holiness. And you start that journey to forgiveness and healing. So because you have been forgiven, you have a new nature, and you do have the ability to forgive. You do have that ability. Don't write it off and don't say you can't. You do. And it is serious, and it is real. And there are molestations in this room. There's family members that have been murdered. There's all kinds of hurt going on in here. But you are called to be set free through forgiveness, guys. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you maybe should do. <laughs> not what it says, does it? You must. It's not an option. It's been said, harboring bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. When you harbor bitterness towards another, you should receive rent from them as they've now taken up residence in your head. You invite them in, you feed them, and you actively serve as their host, even though they make you miserable. But the way to evict them is to forgive them. And you are taking up space in your life that the Holy Spirit would love to occupy. And he's not a bully. He doesn't force his way in, but he's going to take the ground that you give him. And you're better off for it. And that ground many times is filled with unforgiveness. It is possible, it is reasonable, and God gave us that ability, and that ability is a blessing. After washing Jesus' feet, again back to the example of the king, he says, I've given you an example, this is Jesus, that you should also do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And Jesus gives us a radical example of forgiveness, because at the cross we know how much he suffered. And what did he do when he looked down from the cross? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's our example. I'm not greater than Jesus, and if Jesus can forgive, I also need to forgive. Guys, forgiveness is essential for your relationship with God, for your relationships with others, for your marriage or whatever relationship you're in and for your well-being as a human, and certainly as a child of God. So pick up that challenge. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you for this incredible gift of forgiveness. And Lord, those in the room that need to hear this, and maybe they heard it again, maybe they let it go and, and, and gave up, Lord, 70 times 7 is an infinite amount of times that you're calling us to try. So Lord... I just pray that you, through your spirit, give them the strength and your will to forgive and that you would set them free and that joy would well up in their lives because they've been forgiven. And Lord, thank you so much for this incredible blessing of forgiveness from you, forgiveness that we can give and a forgiveness that we can experience in our own lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to go.